1996, uh, the National Intelligence Council, uh, under the leadership of uh, Dick Cooper, an economist at Harvard who was then the chair of the National Intelligence Council and Nick, um, decided that we ought to undertake some type of a look into the future, more strategic look that would deepen our understanding of contemporary developments and provide useful guidance for policymakers who work captives of their inbox. And the 1996 effort was very much an experimentation um, done in a parallel fashion. One was done by the NIC and completely unclassified. And, uh, and another one was done under me in the State Department in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research that was classified. So the initial efforts that began to identify trends that were repeated every four years, we realized that producing this to come out after the presidential election and before inauguration. Uh, after the election, because we didn't want to be accused of playing politics and interfering in the election, but to get it out while the new team or the reconstituted team for the re-election um, is putting people together, is thinking about how to transform election platform promises into policies and prioritize. And to get them to think about the future, not in abstract terms, but in terms of projections of trends that we thought were highly likely to continue uh, and that would be consequential for the success of domestic and foreign policies. The idea of this was not to predict the future. Uh, that there's very little value to a policymaker of a study that comes in and says X will happen. Because the, ex the implication of that is there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and if there's nothing you can do about it, why would you even think about it? Um, that it was to alert folks that this is where we think things are going. If you like where they're going, you want to think about developing policies that keep things moving along that trajectory. If you don't like where they're going, in some respect, you want to think about policies that would change the trajectory prevent the bad stuff from happening, or prepare for and ameliorate the negative consequences. Um, we wanted to keep the number of different uh, megatrends, we call them, um, small, 8 to 12 uh, in, in these studies. And you can't manage um, any more than that, and that's probably pushing, pushing the envelope. But we did this one in uh, 2008. Uh, we began it more than a year uh, before that. It was the fourth effort. This one I was in charge of. Others I participated in, but this one I was in charge of because at that time I was the chairman of the National Intelligence Council. And among the things that we had learned you know, earlier on was you got to involve expertise wherever it is. Uh, the second one reached outside the intelligence community. There are a lot of analysts in the intelligence community, but we reach out to you know, other parts of the U.S. government and beyond. The third one went more, uh, more academic input, more corporate input, and international input. But the one I did, not the exact number, but there were participants from give or take three dozen countries, uh, and we held workshops on every continent except Antarctica. Um, a little bit of a Delphi process of what did people see as, as important, what was driving, what was, what was driving some other, other things, that what was the, the, the proxy issue we could use for lots of developments to get to simulate thinking. Basically, 
and to stimulate thinking at a time when there was a receptive audience. That you don't get very many months into an administration before the time horizon is the end of the administration. Um, and you're talking beyond that. I'm got time for that. It's not going to bite me. What can I do about it in my time? And on this one, uh, I took it to uh, President Obama. I think it was about 10 days after the election, something like that, maybe two weeks in Chicago. But the, the idea of these reports, and I go through the history of this one and Obama. We built in there a scenario. We, in addition to the trends, we use usually uh, uh, four scenarios that try to uh, crystallize general discussions and one of them was on a pandemic a global pandemic of coronavirus in 2025 is when we projected it would happen and the idea was to get thinking about how would this unfold where would it spread who would be affected what did you have to do to prepare for it what kind of equipment would you have to stockpile? What kind of networks uh, linking state, local, national, international players would you have to put in place? And there were things in place before um, in the United States government connected to FEMA, connected to Centers for Disease Control. Uh, but the Obama administration took this on board and convened war gaming kind of activities. Um, convene sessions to, you know, what can you bring to the party, different parts of the government? Where are the gaps? Begin to prepare game plans. Begin to prepare telephone trees. Prepare, uh, brought people together in the same room. So you had a face-to-face -face relationship that linked pieces of the bureaucracy. And it, it was typical of bureaucratic fire extinguisher building, that you want to have a marvelous fire extinguisher so that if you need it, it works, uh, and you hope you don't need it. Um, that's what got put together on infectious diseases. The leadership was there, uh, apparently uh, dismantled by the Trump administration that resulted, among other things, in experienced people leaving the government. So we started with a plan that nobody knew where it was, with people who didn't understand what it was for, uh, organizations not linked by personal ties, not having the bureaucratic preparation, and not being receptive to the warnings that came in. So we are where we are, uh, with the having to piece this together. My own impression from the time I spent in Washington, um, 23 years, most of those in senior positions, I think the system is actually working better than it appears. Uh, that below the, right, below the radar, yes, these problems are, are outrageous. But I think people have pulled up their socks, they've dusted off the plan. We're beginning to do this a lot better than make it up from scratch. Well, this happens to be a topic on which different parts of my career and experience come together. Uh, the China part, which I've been doing for almost 55 years, and the U.S.-China part since 72. And the, and the global trends, including the pandemic. And I don't claim any great expertise on uh, pandemics or health, health issues. But I was in senior enough positions that participated in some of these wars. The ones I did was on smallpox. Once one gets past the dismay at the blame game, finger pointing, ridiculous assertions about China and by China about the United States in, in this. Uh, realize that the interaction 
you know, the, the, the unfortunate state of the relationship now, which is triggered primarily by trade issues and the uh, actions of our administration, but the Chinese bear a very large, if not equal, um, part of the responsibility for the state of the relationship. We bumped up against uh, some see this as worsening the relationship. Some see the relationship as impeding the cooperation that's got to be there. This pandemic is an example of the kind of mega trade global challenges that we worked on that can't be managed, can't be solved, can't be fixed by any country, not certainly not the United States alone, certainly not China alone and probably not China and the United States um, uh, working in isolation from others. But the nature of the U.S.-China relationship and the way in which it is perceived by other countries is a fundamental impediment to cooperation, even on this issue, that uh, where much of the world suspects that any kind of collaborative effort any investment of resources, any how do we prepare for the next inevitable pandemic that pools effort here will be undercut either by the United States or by China. That the need to give others an incentive to invest their own time, effort, resources uh, for a collective good requires a certain degree of confidence that the Americans and the Chinese will work together or at least won't undermine the effort. The Chinese say cooperation is important, but we have to improve the relationship first, have to develop trust. Then we can work together on these international issues. Americans generally take the opposite view. We build trust by working together on concrete problems. Uh, we've got to start now, uh, and we'll build experience, we'll build trust. That's the way most of the last 40 years has evolved. There are folks in both the United States and China that see this pandemic as terrible as it is, as an opportunity to release, reduce tension, use it as an instrument for improving the relationship and pave the way to solving other problems. A nice idea. I think that's backwards. Uh, I think that the impediments to working bilaterally on this problem, quite apart from the low levels of trust, high levels of suspicion, the political weight that has been assigned the salience of this in, by the leadership in both countries, that's a loser. But the necessity for us to cooperate in international forum, uh, the one that is most logical is the World Health Organization. We can't, in the middle of a pandemic, go invent some new mechanism in international organization. That's got lots of problems. It's got more problems now because of the president's decision to withhold funding. Um, and accuse it of being a dupe of China. But working together in an international forum that could, certainly could, lower the political salience, the radioactivity of cooperating on an obvious common problem, and let that be the way that builds towards a better bilateral relationship.